Canadian Business is proud to host its third week of New Innovator Summit, an exciting lineup of thought-provoking live virtual programming with some of Canada's biggest leaders in partnership with the Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and the Business Development Bank Canada. Today's CB Insider's thought leadership panel discussion is about leading through crisis and managing the new culture, featuring Zabine Hirschi, Executive Advisor, Future of Work at Deloitte, Patrick Enns, President at Capital One, and Penny Wise, President and Managing Director, 3M Canada. Welcome, everyone. So on to some quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Please make sure to ask your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll open up an audience Q&A at the end of this chat. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Jason Maginoy, Head of Business Development at St. Joseph Media, and our new Associate Publisher at Canadian Business. Thanks again. Take it away, Jason. Thank you so much for the introduction, Chantel. And <clears throat> so we're going to be talking about a lot of different things. Like, first off, we're doing this panel virtually. Obviously, that's a, a huge uh, segue into what we're going to be discussing, which is how we work now and the future of work and what we're going to be expecting as we enter the new year. Um, but it's wonderful to have you all on this panel. But my first question is always the same. And it's we'll start with Penny, but it's for all three of you, how are you and how have you been holding up during the pandemic? Well, Jason, thanks for the invitation to be here today. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and Patrick and Zabine and, and talk about some really important pieces. Um, delighted to be here. Uh, so how are we holding up? Well, you know, I think that uh, I was reflecting the other day with one of the other members of our leadership team here at 3M Canada, and we were reflecting on back in March 2020, when we sent everyone who could go home, home, and said, see you in a couple of weeks. And it's <laughs> been more than 20 months, right? And it has been a tumultuous journey, and it has been ups and downs. When we thought things were getting better, maybe things took a different turn. But what's always helped is thinking about what are those silver linings of what we've learned during the pandemic, and whether it's virtual working, whether it's flexibility in working, uh, whether it's how we've all come together to support each other, both as business communities, as communities to support, support those most in need in the community, or even for me personally, my 20 something children that I never thought would ever come home again have spent quality time while we've been hunkering down during the pandemic. So it's really, you know, taking a moment to reflect on those silver linings and the work life balance and some of these other pieces, I think has been um, really the way to buoy ourselves through a really challenging time as leaders. Mm, I love that. How about you, Patrick? Yeah, hi, thank you, Jason. And thank you, thank you for having me. Um, reflecting on this question personally, if, if I could for a moment, just, just candidly, the first couple months of the pandemic were very, very difficult. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a father of two. My kids were five and three at the time. They were all of a sudden out of school, out of daycare. My wife and I were working from home and I think the rhythms of working from home, you know, with two kids at home and no support network was uh, a heavy burden, a heavy burden. I really struggled in those first few months and I feel like we've come so far. I mean, to be honest, like now, fortunately, children back in school, the rhythm of working remotely exists. It works a lot better than I probably would have ever expected. And, and Jason, you had actually mentioned, you know, finding this balance and the ability to actually maybe even work more and be more present at home at the same time. I think that has been an amazing silver lining as, as Penny mentioned, but it did take some time to get here. You know, there were some really tough moments uh, in between March, 2020 and like how I feel today, which is, which is great. So thank you for asking Jason. Of course. And how about you, Zabine? Thank you, Jason, uh, for having me uh, and uh, always a great uh, opportunity to learn as well. So uh, keen to hear from uh, from my fellow panelists as well. Uh, so I'm going to speak also probably from the personal side. I'm at a different stage of my career. I'm past my full time, full on uh, executive career. And uh, now I'm an advisor in the uh, private and public sector. Uh, so for me, a lot of it has been quite personal. Um, in, at the outset, I realized um, how much energy I get from being with people. And uh, the, the silver lining there for me was just deepening friendships, creating new friendships, and really discovering that I have this, um, I not only get energy, but I have this skill of convening and bringing people together 
in uh, not just virtually, but I'm fortunate to have a, a, a backyard where I can bring people together. And so in the pandemic, uh, I used it, I've used it more in the last 20 months than I have in the last 15 years. Um, but that the the power of connection and, and, and um, engagement was really amplified for me. And um, I would say the the other thing is my my children like pennies are in their 20s and it hasn't been that easy for for younger people minors new in their work lives starting their careers and even just their lives and their social lives mm -hmm. and uh, and it has also brought home for me the role of organizations in really supporting that, uh, cohort of our employees as they re-enter workplace, but even just in general, what are we going to do to really help their uh, their health, their mental health, their well-being? Um, because that is the parallel uh, pandemic or endemic, if you wish. That's that's really happening, and uh, that's uh, for me has really been an important. Uh, message learning and something i'm now talking yeah, about and i think that there's something really just the diversity of experience for everyone during the pandemic it's been fascinating to see and you know this takes me to my first question which is which is for penny and and you had that really great point about how like hey you're gonna go home i'll see you in a couple of weeks i literally felt that way too and then during the two weeks like my hair grew like extra long and i had a beard and i was like bombing like i was like man like i'm in utter disarray right now so it, Everyone was scrambling. So how did 3M pivot? Like, how did you build resilience for your team at the start of the pandemic? And then the extension of that is, how did it change your business? And how did it change your relationship with your customers? I, I loved reflecting on this question as we started to talk about it. And, and it really comes back to, um, I had the great fortune, I was working for 3M for 20 years to be in their international organization and travel the world. What I discovered as part of that travel and engaging in brand and reputation with the rest of the world and the organization is inside every 3 m -er around the world, there is a spark inside each one of us. And that spark is about doing right, problem solving, making the world a better place, finding solutions. And I think that's at the core of who we are. And that's what the core of resiliency is. You know, 3 m is a hundred year old company, more than a hundred years old. And some of that resiliency is really based in this 15% culture. So I think many of you have probably heard that you know, 3M has this, this guidance of you can spend up to 15% of your time working on a project that isn't related mm -hmm. to what your day job is to really help creativity and resilience or you know, knowledge from failure. So yes, your experiment didn't work out. Yes, the adhesive for the original for that went on to post it wasn't what it was originally intended for, but there was a learning and something to take forward. And so it drove creativity, we drive curiosity. And I think that leads to kind of five things that resiliency is about that we've learned about ourselves at 3M. And I think all of us as business leaders could take forward. And the first one is about problem solve. Our customers' problems are changing. We have to pivot and figure out what the solutions are to those new problems. We have to think about collaboration, collaboration and how we work together. There are different ways to work together now than how we worked pre-pandemic. A little harder to have those hallway coffee chats, a little harder to meet each other in tech forums. So what are the new ways to collaborate and how do we leverage technology to do that and how to create moments that matter to get together? This idea of always looking out for each other, and I, and I think that's a really important part of being resilient is not only thinking about your situation, but thinking about others. So Zabine, when you were talking about your children and um, mental health and the 20 somethings and how are they going to move forward? Again, it's just thinking about who else, how can we support those inside where we work? How do we support those outside and how do we help our communities? Fourth was around agility. Again, all of us having to pivot, all of us having to think about different ways to do things and engage and uh, look at our businesses differently. In At 3M, some of our businesses exploded rapidly because there was a desperate need for N95 respirators or medical equipment. Others contracted because stores had closed. So it really was about being agile and just pivoting to focus on those areas where we, where we needed to support. And then fifth and last area that I always think all of us can learn from is fostering curiosity. What can we do differently? How can we look at things? 
if I just provide a, a 3M example, it really is around N95 respirators. Um, we, uh, uh, as we moved into the pandemic, there was a desperate need by healthcare workers around the world for N95 respirators. Here in Canada, same thing. And I'm really proud of how we all stepped up in order to be able to expand our Brockville facility to uh, manufacture N95 respirators to meet the needs of healthcare workers in Canada. And it's an internal and external partnership with the federal government, with the Ontario government, with 3M. We brought in global resources from 3M. We had people go to the US to learn how to manufacture and run equipment, people spending time away from their families, but everybody focused on the goal of solving a problem, of being agile, of making things better, of leveraging their curiosity and being able to pull things forward. It's just a 3M example. I see that across the board in Canadian business. As you look at all of the things that business has done in the last 20 months to pivot, to find new ways to go to market, to new ways to engage with their customers, I think it's a real hallmark of Canadian business resiliency. Wow. I mean, I love all of those values that you listed. Just, um, man, it, it is so true when you would, when you'd stumble upon that really worked out well or those really those moments that matter with coworkers during the pandemic and, and having the ability to learn and continually evolve and knowing that you had the ability to do that during this time. I, I loved all of those things. Um, so, I mean, my next question is for Patrick, which is, so where is the Capital One team right now? <laughs> are they like, are they in the office? Are they remote? Yeah. They, where are they? We're predominantly uh, remote at this point, Jason. I'm, I'm at home right now in, in my home, and, and that's true of most Capital One Canada associates. Um, you know, early on in the pandemic, we were quick to move to, to fully remote in, in early March, really putting the health and safety of our, our associates and our people front and center, and also the communities they're living in, and what, what we owe the communities uh, that we're part of, and in thinking through. Penny's response, uh, thank you to Penny and the 3M team for sacrificing all that they did to deliver more N95 masks for, for people in Canada. I think that's amazing. And this was in one way, uh, a one, one way for us to contribute, right? Um, we, we also have heard from our associates that there's a lot of nerves about returning to the, in the winter months uh, here in Canada. And uh, we really want to listen uh, and understand their concerns and make sure we do right by our associates. So we don't have intentions on returning here in the near, near term, we won't, won't return to the office in, in 2021. And, and when we do, it'll be sometime in 2022. And then the model is going to look a lot different. You know, before the pandemic, we were predominantly in the office and, and the model working to is one we call flexible hybrid, which really means we're giving associates and leaders the flexibility uh, to choose where they do their work best. So we're going to have many associates who spend a bunch of their time in the office. We're going to have many associates who spend a lot of their time remote. We're going to have a lot of associates who do both of those things. I'll, I'll probably be one of those. Um, and so I'm looking forward to testing that out and, and seeing what that really means and what opportunities that produces for us. Mm. I mean, my follow-up question for you is, you know, one of the things that I thought was really fascinating about the pandemic was I, I went to a retreat for one of our magazines last week and I was meeting people for the first time and I've been working with them for two years. So because of the fact that we're in this sort of work remote, hybrid, we're home, how do you manage culture? So how do you manage culture in an environment like that? How do you keep your team motivated and energized? And how do you redefine success when your company is functioning in that way? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think great, great question. And, and honestly, culture has been impacted by the pandemic and moved to remote. I think it'd be, it'd be crazy to deny that there's an impact on that. and. One thing that stays true, though, is the purpose of your organization, right? So as you heard Penny share the stories of 3M, similar at Capital One, the, the purpose behind what we do stays the same. And ultimately, we're trying to help Canadians achieve greater financial well-being. And how we do that has changed during the pandemic. Um, you know, so, so culturally, what we're trying to do is build connection to that purpose, which drives connection to our organization. And we're trying to drive connection to each other. So when I talk about driving connection to our purpose in the organization, that's all about communication. You know, for us, as an example, my leadership team hosts monthly webcasts for the entire Team Canada. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the purpose of our organization, the work that's going on, and how associates are contributing to better outcomes for our customers. And then to foster connection amongst each other, we've tried to do things, we've tried to mimic things in the virtual environment, 
that we might have more naturally occurred in the office. And we've actually had some success with that. So <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite things we've done is this thing called coffee roulette. And you just put your name in the hat and then you get randomly paired with someone. You <laughs> might know them, you might not. You have a virtual coffee, you build connection, you meet someone new. I mean, it's not 100% the same as doing it in person because you got to make your own coffee and sometimes I forget so I'm just talking without the coffee uh, but it is a wonderful way to do it and we get a huge portion of our associates to get into that um, and then Jason just before I, before I let you move on the last thing you talked about is energy I mean energy has been one of the most difficult things to muster during the pandemic and something that's been I think so true about that is this kind of malaise that sets in with the day-to-day -day monotony in some ways of dialing back into the same Zoom spot over and over again. Uh, something we've done that uh, I think has been really valuable, we give all our associates, I take advantage of this myself, uh, one day a month, it's typically the last Friday of the month, we call it Invest in Yourself Day, and it's do whatever you gotta do to refocus, recharge, or decompress. Wow. Um, and it helps me a ton, honestly. Personally, it helps me a ton, and I've heard amazing feedback from our people as well. Wow. And I love hearing, I'm, I'm basically going to take all of those ideas. I really, I really love those. So my question is, my next question is for Zabine, which is, so everyone was talking about how the pandemic accelerated everything 50 years in one year kind of stuff. So it looks like the future of work is here or is it? So, so in terms of work models is what is permanent? Like what is the permanent change here? Uh, yeah, so it's interesting. I, I've been talking about future of work for, for some time and uh, didn't always have uh, a willing audience. It has become one of the hottest topics, but in some ways I've actually started to stop using the term because it's the new world of work. The, the future is now and we, we need to uh, be clear on that. Uh, in terms of what's going to stick hybrid, and I love, Patrick, your, your term flexible hybrid, it's here to stay. It, it was here in bits and bobs before on an exception basis. It's here, we know it works and there's, there's no springing back, it's about springing forward. So that is not gonna change. What is really important, and uh, uh, Patrick, you I think did that in your comments, is to have balanced conversations about it with employees. It, what I'm seeing a little bit is employees want this, organizations want that. We actually want the same thing. We are, uh, we are guided by our North Star of our purpose. We are guided by our vision. We want to have impact on the organization in the communities in, in which we work and live. And so how do we reset those conversations around hybrid? How are we going to work with that view of of course we get it. Who wants to commute? Of course we get it. Work-life integration, family integration, uh, being in your yoga pants, although I did wear, <laughs> I, I didn't wear them today. Um, I, I do try to be business casual dressed so that uh, it just has that sort of feeling of, of uh, I, I'm in a different zone. Uh, and, and then talking about culture, what are the new behaviors that we're seeing that we want to keep what are the behaviors, the unintended behaviors that we want to shed? And how are we going to move together on this new culture? The same around productivity. That's probably the, the most, uh, culture and productivity are the two things that I would say CEOs are, are talking about the most. And we can't really, we don't know the impact on productivity. We have not been living in normal times. The what what has happened in the last 20 months is under very different circumstances. You said, Jason, you've been working more hours. You have. The data shows that. Is that sustainable? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and so to make permanent decisions on how the last 20 months, two years has played out, um, I don't think we're ready for that. And I like to think about it, and that's how Deloitte frames it, as the next normal. Let's work together for, to, to get us to the next normal. And again, you know, Patrick, you talked about not going back until March. I know a lot of, or until the, the spring, I know a lot of organizations are doing that, but the framing is really important. The worst time to come back to the office is in the winter. 
So why would we, we why would we do that? Why would we not uh, listen to employees, engage with employees? Because there's no question through the pandemic, we've seen the rise of employee voice. That's not mm -hmm. going to change. The uh, you know, there, I think the New York Times um, had something in April, which was quite some time ago, where they where where they said that this is. For the first time in a generation, workers are gaining the upper hand. Uh, we did a survey at Deloitte. 86% of global executives said that they believe workers will gain greater independence and influence relative to their employers. That's going to stay. There's one thing I do want to touch on that doesn't get much conversation. We're talking about office workers or knowledge workers, if you will. 35 to 40% of jobs can be done partially or fully from home. There is also the workforce, the other 60% that want flexibility, that want to be able to better integrate their work and life. Frontline workers who we've been heralding yes. through, the, through the, the, the pandemic, what are we going to do for them? How are we going to uh, create uh, whether it's I there's a there's a municipality in Ontario I forget which one that has created a four day or a nine day four four day week or a nine day fortnight, which gives their frontline workers the opportunity to at least have they work longer days but to have that time to do what they need to do that they can't necessarily integrate every day, but they're gonna have that sort of flexibility. How do we give uh, people, you know, part-time workers, more um, fixed schedules so that they can plan their lives and aren't waiting for you know, Thursday to find out when they're working wow. next week. So I would like to see more conversation on, um, on, that, uh, on, on that particular segment. Um, and then finally, I would say what's also changed is leadership has become more human, purpose-driven, filled with humanity. That happened through the pandemic. We get to see one another and our lives, our homes, our pets, our kids. <laughs> The 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 uh, the struggle to juggle, Patrick. I'm sure your little ones showed up on your calls, uh, <laughs> or you could hear them. The noise, uh, you know, the noise directors didn't take uh, take all of that off. And all of a sudden, we are connecting at a human level. We are seeing how how much how much we are the same as opposed to different. And employees love it. They love that empathetic, caring, compassionate. And I think a lot of leaders love it too. At the end of the day, we all want to be human. And I can see a little bit of pullback on that soft stuff starting to happen in some organizations, which is, oh, okay, that was fine during the pandemic. Uh, I think that's the new reality. And that's what employees want. Wow. I mean, that idea of being more human, it's almost, well, that, that's actually a great segue into my next question, which is about a me like mega trends, like being more human, the power of a worker's voice, those seem to be things that are growing. Is there anything else that we should keep an eye on? out for in the horizon on the horizon like is it going to be more ai at work will we be in the metaverse working and doing all kinds what will my will it be my avatar hosting the next one of these virtual Maybe. Bars like so so what are some mega trends you can share with us that you're seeing yeah so i'm still trying to figure out metaverse and you know will will that'll sort of un, unfold <laughs> uh, as, as all the the various technologies come together and as you say there's the you know is it going to be your avatar uh, but clearly ai it, it that's we've been on that path for quite some time it's certainly in our customer experiences as well as in our employee experiences for me the the important thing there is i think about it as human machine collaboration it's not one or the other how do we use that so that humans do what we do inherently better and, and use AI as a tool. And what I often say to leaders that you know, what, um, what could be automated or where we could use technology doesn't mean it should be. We need mm -hmm. to be thoughtful. We need to make decisions uh, that really consider uh, the, the, the impact. But there's how do we use it? Everyone's talking about how do we use it for good? And how do we engage our employees 
to to also help figure it out so it's not a one versus the versus the other and we've all touched on the the trend of the changing societal expectations our employees are part of society as are our customers customers care about how we treat our employees oh. customers tell us that it drives their their buying decisions uh, it's 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 got a very strong case, and uh, you you layer in their ESG, and that's a whole different conversation. Uh, but those trends will also um, will also drive that. Um, if I can just say one thing to Penny's point, because I wrote that down, Penny, I really like. I've heard it before, but it's not used universally. This fifteen percent culture, and what's going through my mind is in in industries where they're less about product development, if you will, and more about service, innovation, et cetera, financial services, which is where I spent my entire, uh, my entire full-time career. Uh, maybe that's a way to get to the concern around how are we going to keep up our innovation and creativity in this hybrid world? Is that a way to... Uh, to to um, create the space for for people to do it and then help them with tools to to have to make those connections because it's not just the strong ties you want to get to the weak ties as well yeah. so your coffee um, your your coffee chats uh, uh, Patrick are are about weak ties which is just um, getting strangers who just work at the same company together but I've that's something I really am, am keen to sort of think through and, and talk through a little bit more, um, your 15% culture, Penny. I love, yeah, I love that. The 50% culture is just um, the sense that I'm getting more encouragement for some of the other things that I do in my life and how they contribute to work. Like my background is I'm a playwright. So I went to the National Theater School. I'm a playwright. I was playwright in residence at Alberta Theater Projects this year. Like I... I write plays and I find that when I'm being creative in that part of my life, my work flourishes. Um, so I think that that knowing that there is a bridge between mm -hmm. those other areas of someone's life that have a ton of value, it'll add value at work. And I, I love that. And, and this actually takes my question for you, Penny, is this idea of like skill development. Like one of the things that I find really fascinating about Zoom was that um, I love using Zoom. I love using Google. Someone said, hey, join me on Microsoft Teams. I didn't know how. <laughs> like, I was just like struggling. They were like, I had a meeting yesterday. There were eight me's in a meeting. And I'm like, how'd that happen? So the question is, for skill development, how has, what has 3M done to support its team as you've moved into basically a virtual digital space for work? So oh, this is why we all have children to help us figure out how to use all these meeting spaces, right? No, um, I'm sure Patrick, your three and five year old can help you get onto any platform that you need to get onto. Um, so it, what was really interesting was just prior to the start of the pandemic, uh, 3M, we globally, we had embarked on some business transformation. And part of that um, and how we worked together was um, updating and, and a significant investment on our online tools and our virtual platforms and our virtual ways of engaging. And Microsoft Teams, sorry, Jason, is one of those core <laughs> platforms. I'm an expert on Microsoft Teams apparently these days. And so we had already started that fundamental transition. Mm. Uh, what's interesting, you know, taking beyond the skills just a little bit further is the opportunities that have arisen for skills for the future of 3Mers around the world, what we discovered was, as we've worked across the world, is you don't have to be at the head office here in London, Ontario for Canada or in the Twin Cities in the United States in order to do a global job. And so decisions that people had to make pre-pandemic of, am I prepared to move to the US, to the Twin Cities, to uproot my family? Um, those decisions decisions are different decisions now and different ways to view where you're going to go and how you're going to do the job. So I think it's kind of put everybody on a level playing field. There isn't a better place to be in the world. There isn't a worse place to be in the world. And I think it's really helped elevate 
and shine a light on the talent that we have across the organization and given a lot of leaders to really understand, well, where are those skills out there? Where is the talent? How can we manage that talent and how can we drive things forward? So I think it's, as we think about the future of work and the skills that we're going to need, it is going to be kind of making an alignment of the stuff. What are the best parts of virtual technology that we can bring forward? And then what are those elements that we're going to have to do in person? What are those things that help create those connections? What are those things that drive innovation forward? And uh, Patrick talked about it and Zabine talked about it. 3M also has what we call work your way, which is going to be a very flexible approach to work moving forward, where you can decide, should I be, should, can I be fully remote? Can I be hybrid? Can I come into the office? How do I get that right work life balance? And that is the new norm. That is how we're going to operate as a company. It is about making sure we're empowering people to work the way they want to work and support their family and work towards better work-life balance. And I do believe people are working longer hours, but I think people are able to balance, have lunch, walk kids to school. Uh, and I think it will make a significant difference in, um, in, in our lives. And I had one other piece that I would just tack on to this kind of work your way and flexibility. Zabine, you talked about there's a large part of our workforce that isn't working from home. And you talked about frontline workers, but as a manufacturer, I think about people in our facilities and our manufacturing facilities who didn't get to go home at the beginning of the pandemic, who worked through, who continued and worked really safely. But we're even thinking about what does flexibility and development look like from their perspective? How do we be more flexible in shift adjustment? or vacation backfilling. So we don't have answers for all of those things yet, but we're trying to take a very broad-based view across all of our employees to help in a virtual world, to help in that new way of working, to help in that new model. And it, you sound like a great boss. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm like, I, everything you're saying is really resonating with me. Um, it, it sounds fantastic. And, and that actually, like, I'm going to jump now to Patrick, which is, you know, we talked about how 3M's brand had evolved. What happened with Capital One, like how, how did the brand evolve over the course of the pandemic and how did your relationships with your customers change? Yeah, thank you, Jason. Similar, I think similar to Penny at, at Capital One, you know, the, the things that we were always trying to do were still the things that we were trying to do, but the way that we needed to do them changed a lot and the way that our customers needed us to show up for them also changed. You know, so when I think back to the early days of, of the pandemic, our customers were looking for immediate short-term financial relief in ways yeah. that, that they hadn't before, right? Because there had never been so much uncertainty about what was going to happen to many people all at once. Um, and so, you know, in, in those kind of early days, yeah, there was a lot of collaboration, a lot of scrambling, a lot of long hours work just to find some very short-term solutions that would help our customers uh, be successful. And, and I think we really delivered on that too. And for our associates, that really, you know, kind of hammered home a core strength that we feel like we've always had around our resilience, both as an organization as, and as people. Like when you're where we are now and you look back at what we accomplished, you can take a ton of pride and a ton of confidence in going forward based on what, what you delivered. Um, and then I say it's, it's, it's a much different, much more forward-looking view now, right? I mean, I, Capital One is a, is a digital first financial institution in Canada. So we are celebrating the acceleration of the digital journey that is happening right now. That positions us incredibly well for the future. Um, during 2020 alone, I think the, the percentage of uh, contactless transactions, you know, those tap with your phone or a plastic went up 43% in one year. Wow. And two in five Canadians did an in-store transaction with their mobile device, myself included, which I you know, could never have saw myself doing. Uh, it's just, it's just moved everything on the same trajectory we were always planning for it to go at a much steeper rate. And, and so for us, that feels awesome because it just brings a very exciting future much closer uh, to the present. I love the fact that, I mean, looking, that was a, a really telling thing to sort of seeing financial organizations that were offering support to their customers. It was just like, wow, that's great to see at the beginning of the pandemic. And going back to what Zabine was saying about how, if you see how people are treating their, like organizations are treating their customers, you're probably getting a sense of how they're treating um, their employees. And I, I think that that bridge is, is fantastic and a great way to look at companies now. Um, my question 
my next question is for Zabim, which is, you know, when it comes to what people are looking for, when it comes to work now, so like, like, you know, I recently had a child, I spend a lot of time with him, I bring him to meetings, he's terrible at meetings, like horrible at meetings, it's, I don't recommend it, he's just, he doesn't contribute, he doesn't have any value, he's a baby, but I've noticed that, you know, workers, in terms of the considerations they're making for their future prospects for work, for me, my biggest consideration is, can I still maintain time with him because so I want to be home and I want to have the ability to stay home. So what are workers caring about now in terms of their future prospects for work? And then my follow-up question to that is, everyone is talking about it. What are your thoughts on the great resignation? Is that even a thing that's happening in Canada? Uh, so a lot to unpack there. I would start with the headline, one size doesn't fit all. It never did, but now employees are actually willing to vote with their feet if they are not getting um, uh, this sort of um, a, a customized approach. There are things that are going to be core, absolutely, but what's a customized? No different than customer experience. I think there's a lot we can learn from customer experience and how that translates to employee experience because the needs change over time as well. They're not static. And uh, so organizations have to get uh, really good, better at applying design thinking and different ways of really building out that, um, that employee experience. So what do employees want? And I, I, I'll touch a little bit on where work is done, but one of the, the, the things that has really um, popped up is employees are also focusing on the why of work. Wow. And so they're, so they're asking questions like, um, you know, what kind of work do I want to do? Uh, what kind of, uh, what is the, what opportunities is this, emp my employer or prospective employer providing me to make a difference beyond the bottom line? So we've seen organizations really move to this purpose-led, purpose-driven, and we've, we've heard it from both Patrick and Penny, um, at the organizational level and at the individual level, I think about it as meaning. I want to do work that's meaningful. And the pandemic has, I, I see it having really brought that to the fore, where people are saying uh, that I'm not going to wait to do that someday or after I retire. I want to do it in my work. And so organizations who get really good at being able to translate how that their the, the purpose is is that they're driving towards achieving the purpose but by creating ways for which employees um, can do their work and 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 have this broader impact so that is a trend uh, it's the great reset is what i think about it as as as, as humans we're just kind of saying you know what it's time to do it now the other thing that I find very interesting, your question around great resignation, there has been some press around, well, it's not really happening in Canada. It is. I talk to, <laughs> and I can see, you know, I can see the nod there. I talk to um, CHROs and, and CEOs all the time. And yes, they're experiencing it. And not just in the business sector, in the public sector as well. And it's being experienced in different ways. Yesterday, I was with a with a very senior person in, the, in, a, in a public sector. And they said to me, people are declining promotions. Whoa. That is a, another way of this great reset, great resignation wow. playing out. So they're saying, you know what? No, I don't want to take on more. I, I'm, I'm already overloaded and I want to, I, I, so, um, and we don't have the same kind of data for a, in Canada that US does in, in terms of being able to really, you know, we don't measure things, stats Canada doesn't measure things in the same way. How That said, a recent uh, a McKinsey study, they looked at people, they, and most of the studies are saying about 40% of people are considering leaving. Wow. And about 20%, McKinsey study was 18% saying that they um, are, that it's, it's a high consideration for them. And it was the same in Canada as it was in the US, Australia, UK. So it, it is happening and people have 
actually saved money during the pandemic, right? You've been home, you haven't gone on vacation, you haven't had to buy new clothes, restaurants, all kinds of things. And 25% uh, of people who are leaving their jobs do not have another job to go to. They're just saying, done. I've, I know I can do it. I've managed through the pandemic. I'm resilient. I can figure it out. I'm just going to take some time off and I'm going to do it. So that's my answer to uh, the great resignation. But it is a bit of how do you turn this great attrition to a great attraction and organizations focused on purpose and meaning. And something that's underutilized is how do you make people feel appreciated? So the data is showing that employees say that's one of the top reasons why they're leaving because they feel underappreciated by their managers and by their organizations. What's missing here though is what is it that's gonna make them feel appreciated? Maybe it's changed. Maybe it's different when you're working remote. I, I don't have the answers there, but I think really we need to explore what sits beneath that where employees are um, are saying that, and we did a survey at Deloitte with LifeWorks, which is focused on senior leaders and uh, mental health and well-being, uh, where that also popped up. And uh, one interesting thing from that research is men actually said that more often than women. Our mindset is sometimes, oh, maybe there's a gender difference the other way. So I would like to really get to the bottom of what is it that uh, that that helps, you know, that makes people feel, um, feel appreciated. And then the third point, uh, I like to talk in three is this around <laughs> hybrid. Um, yeah, it's that people want flexibility, people also un underlying that people want autonomy, mm -hmm. they want autonomy around where their work is done, when their work is done, how their work is done. Tell let's agree on the outcomes and the outputs of what I'm doing, and then let me figure it out. Because by the way, I've been doing that the last 20 months. I've already shown that I can figure out the, 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 the how. And that's another thing that maybe doesn't always surface when we talk flexibility. It is um, it, it is something, and if we think about it as individuals, or oh, it's it's so important. And for those of us that have you know, that that raise children, the big issue is always around the the autonomy and that uh, uh, um, flexibility within a frame. Wow, there's so much to unpack there. It's so funny because when you when you ask the question why, like, why do you work? <laughs> I was like, I have no idea. You, that was a very scary moment for me, but thank you for that one. Um, that was incredible to unpack in terms of just all the different things and how workers are empowering themselves and they're creating situations for themselves to flourish and they're doing work that matters to them and matters to hopefully the country. I think that that's a really great way to look at sort of work in general. So my, my next question is for Penny, which is so, we were talking about brand values. You were talking about some of the great brand values that 3M has. It has become a very hot topic. Like customers care, employees care, everyone cares about this now. Where do you stand on certain things? And the biggest one is diversity and inclusion. How has 3M integrated DNI into its culture? When I think about DE and I, I really think about inclusive. And I think about developing a really safe work environment so that people feel safe to bring their whole self to work and who they truly are. And that when you can bring your whole self to work and love what you're doing and be really comfortable, just like all the things that Bean was talking about of being appreciated yeah. for that, that, that is when we create the right environment and that is when we are inclusive and that is when we do our best work and that is when companies are most successful. Mm -hmm. And so it's very much um, got to be embedded in the culture. And, and again, I've talked a lot about 3M's cultural imperatives and where we came from. And again, really proud. This company had diversity, equity, and inclusion in its DNA, in its foundation. Our original founder very much focused on inclusive and bringing forward ideas and, and being open to new ideas and different opinions. And I think that has permeated our culture. And so today, 3M's focused 
on equality in three areas. First of all, equality in our workplace and making sure that our workplace does reflect the communities and the world in which we work and our customers and our stakeholders uh, in our processes and, and how we operate every day and also supporting our communities. Internally, we focus a lot on learning. So providing opportunities for all of our employees around the world to understand um, what diversity, equity, and inclusion means, understands the issues that we're facing in our countries, uh, making sure they learn and understand more about, um, di about diversity. Uh, mentoring, again, people up and not just mentoring, like not just role modeling, but being a champion, being a champion for change. All of us have been at a point in our career where we've had somebody who's lifted us up, who's moved us forward, who's given us opportunities. That's part of building diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then uh, we have this really wonderful group that we call our employee resource network. And we have one for um, multicultural, we have one for women's leadership, we have one for abilities first, wow. our indigenous network, and we have a pride group. And these ERN groups are all volunteers internally in our company who feel really passionate about this and want to engage internally and externally to help us learn, to help us develop. And beyond that, like that's more of our internal external. Um, I'm really excited in Canada, we've really focused on this idea of STEM equity and that there are underrepresented groups across Canada who do not get the same um, access to STEM. And we've pulled together a series of experts from across the country. We're having STEM talks, we have an advocacy fund and we're really thinking about how do you drive to true change? And again, kind of coming back into this idea of when you asked me about how we're integrating it into our culture, it's about taking action. It's about not just talking about it, but it's really taking action and driving leadership and uh, being an agent for change inside the organization and outside the organization to drive uh, to drive inclusive inclusivity. Wow, I, mean, I just love how purposeful everything is. Like just you're doing everything on purpose. And I, I, I love that in terms of just, especially a company as big as 3M, that's phenomenal. All of us are part of the Canadian community. All of us are part of that fabric and all of us business government, educators, families, communities all have that opportunity to step up and serve and, and build that fabric. I love that. And, you know, that this takes me to a question I have for Patrick, which is, you know, there's been so, we have talked about so much stuff and we have three incredible leaders here. So how has your leadership style changed during the pandemic? And, and what have you learned about leadership during this time? <clears throat> Yeah, I'm going to attempt to build on what I thought was uh, a really poignant and, to be honest, inspiring point from Zabine, who talked about two things. One, leadership has become a lot more personal, and, and I feel that deeply. I feel like, you know, I've, I, I've been at Capital One Canada here for 15 years, and I feel like the world has shifted in many ways, and one of those is in how relationships form at work and the expectations that we have of each other. And even though I'm working for a business, the relationships are in fact very personal and now more personal than they've ever been. Because mm -hmm. Jason, I'm gonna see your struggles and your triumphs as a new dad during the work day, literally, right? Like this is gonna happen and you're gonna see mine, right? You're gonna see me yell at my kids. That's gonna, I'm sorry, that's gonna happen, right? Um, and, and that's just way different. And, and then something I find incredibly inspiring, I think, like if I had to point to something that I think could really move the world forward in a good way, it's the fact that expectations of people is really increasing of our leaders. Mm. And so, you know, people in my organization expect me to be a positive agent for change in really big things, you know, in breaking down barriers that are creating systemic racism. There's an expectation that I'm actively doing something and there should be in containing climate change. There's an expectation that I have a perspective and that I'm personally doing something. Mm. When I think about the power of that and just how much is gonna have to change to meet the expectations of people that are, are coming up in the work world now, um, I feel a lot more motivated and inspired to believe that we're gonna see the really big changes in the world that we all, we all wanna see. And, and so I feel like, you know, I'm a small part of that, but like in just incredibly motivated by that. You know, and for me personally, as a leader, that's, that's meant I got to focus a lot more on listening and learning to listen and listen well, um, because I can't be a very strong leader for people if I don't understand them, if I don't know where they're coming from, and I don't really know where they want to go. 
Um, so there's just this incredible onus on me to understand who they are uh, more than there's ever been. And I, I mean, I just find that like, I think that's going to do incredible things for, for the country and the world that we live in. Patrick, you sound like a great boss too. Thank you. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I'm just, trying to be. I'm, no, I'm noticing a trend here, <laughs> just great bosses. I love that. But it's actually, so the final question of the fireside chat, and it's for it's for Zabine, which is, you know, it, we're you're you're you've demonstrated so much learning that's been happening, so many changes, more changes to come, giant shifts in the infrastructure of our economy and how we work and what we want and how we're going to continue. So with all of this change happening all at once, are you optimistic about the rebuilding of this country, economically, everything post COVID nineteen? Yes, I am. I'm optimistic because this is a, first of all, it's really, it's a once in a generation, once in a lifetime opportunity and people get that. This is what we've been talking about. Uh, we see the, the, the potential of creating a very different world. Uh, Patrick talked about um, as a leader, the, the opportunities he has, that's what everybody wants. Employees want the same thing too. They want to be able to unlock their potential, their passion, and to be able to harness it in different ways. And at the, at the foundation of that is building, uh, deliberately building and evolving the relationship that we have with employees. How, what are we doing to make that magic happen? What are we doing to create those? It's not going to be easy. I'm not, you know, I don't want to be overly Pollyannish. It's going to take work. It's going to take effort. And how do we create those trust-based relationships with employees and also with other partners? I think, Penny, you talked about collaborating with other sectors. That is the other big thing that's been become so clear with, uh, with the pandemic and also with the natural disasters that, uh, that we are in, in the midst of in, in BC right now is, as we speak. Uh, and so that's what I'm optimistic about. People are motivated, people wanna do it. We've seen glimpses of how that's possible. And, um, but we have to move quickly. It, the problem with time is we get back to what feels more normal mm. is this inertia that could take us back to, oh, let's just go back to the way we were. Although, you know, that's not possible, but sort of not actually uh, being able to, to get there. So for the reason, I mean, I've always been about unlocking the potential of people, all people, to build inclusive prosperity. And this is, uh, this is that moment. Uh, and I will make one plug for people in my stage of life. As I said, I had a 40 year career at RBC. I was a CHRO for 10 years until 2017. And now am in, this, uh, in, in, the, in a different phase. And I think there's an opportunity to also unlock more people's potential at my phase to contribute mm. to building this better Canada, this better economy, this better society, and to really harness and leverage our experience, our social capital, our passion for, for the country. Uh, that to me is, is uh, also very exciting and something that I personally am starting to get more engaged in, in really creating. And everything here we're talking about is turning this moment into a movement. That is just the perfect way to end this fireside chat. This was incredibly inspiring. Um, you know, seeing it as an opportunity, seeing it transitioning into a movement, seeing all of the great work that you're doing on the front lines of, of changing uh, the workforce in Canada, it's just, it's amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Penny, Patrick, Sabine, thank you again. I learned a ton. And if you notice that I stole all your ideas, I apologize in advance, but it's a compliment. Um, thank you again for joining us. Thank you everyone for joining this fireside chat. We have more great ex experiences coming up over the course of the month, but everyone stay safe and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. But again, thank you for joining us.